Hello and welcome to another episode of The Empathetic Atheist. My name is Justin. Uh, welcome to another episode uh, of The Empathetic Atheist with the attach-on of the Bumper Car Bible Study. Uh, so we've done two episodes already and we're on to the third. Uh, we've only made it to Genesis 1-8 so far, but that means that we're really digging into this, uh, into this Bible and, and, and seeing what we all really, really think it means. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. I just want to say hi to uh, James, Tired Skeptic. Uh, Brad West is in here. And for right now, that's all we got. But I should see some more people popping up here soon. Uh, but yeah, uh, let's see everybody else in the show. We have Wes, Noah, and Mercy are teaming up to, uh, to, to make us Christians. Um, you got Wendy, who is uh, Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Uh, we have Denise, the Printer Lady, who is of the Jewish faith, and we have Kirk, who is also of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. So we should have a really good episode and, uh, and see see exactly where we get into this. Um, how are you guys doing today? How, Wes, did you get some sleep? Yeah, <laughs> you're muted, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> got got some sleep sweet um how hope the uh hope the wife's birthday was 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 cool did you guys do anything no okay okay yeah it's it's hard to do stuff on a birthday yeah it's hard to do something on a birthday or an anniversary with this covid crap going around you're kind of limited on on what you can do um, but yeah, um, Noah and Mercy, you guys are sitting right inside of a whole bunch of rain that we can't see. Is that correct? <laughs> Does it rain a lot out there? Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Wendy, how, how was your weekend, Wendy? <laughs> well, I, I I enjoy and cherish every single every single moment I can uh, when it comes to days off because with with the job that I have I'm on call like five six days out of the month on top of the fifty hours that I work a week so any time off I'm I'm like yes yes thank you be able to sit that's why I moved I moved from my my computer from one room to where I was sitting in a wooden chair. And you guys can't see, but there is a disgustingly uh, horrible couch that I'm sitting on. So I got my green screen covering it up. It is. It is. I, I get to uh, I get to lay back and and enjoy the uh, enjoy the show. Denise, how are you doing? Gotcha, gotcha. Well, all you got to do is play a few rounds of Tetris, and, and you'll figure it out in no time. That's that's how I figured out how to organize everything. I give credit to Tetris all day long. Kirk, how have you been? I haven't talked to you in about a week. Okay, okay. Have you have you had any uh, angry coaches tell you you gave a bad call here lately? Yeah, I I grew up umpiring once I would turn like ten years old. I started umpiring t-ball games. And I'll tell you what, even in T-ball, those coaches will literally get it right up in your face. You're like, what do you mean? It's T-ball. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm glad you guys are doing good. Uh, if you guys want to, we'll go ahead and jump right into things. Uh, like I said, we're going to be starting at uh, Genesis 1-8. And 1-8 starts off by saying, in God, God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So uh, that's kind of like the end of 
uh, I guess you could say this portion of the of this text. Um, so I I just wanted to read. Let's say, yeah, I'll read from six through eight just to give everybody an overview of kind of what we went over. Excuse me, last week to kind of to kind of sum it up with with verse eight. Uh, verse 6 says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Verse 7 says, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament, firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And that's, I guess I just make a, an observation that at least in my King James and in my quad has heaven capitalized. So to me, I would say that's the abode of God. Yeah, but the, um, but the other, um, the other times that this, the word that's used here is, is translated it is usually a reference to sky and so right. um, something and so, we noted last week too was that um, in verse 5 day and night are capitalized too and that maybe it doesn't necessarily mean that that's like their name but that's what God's calling them says so the first we actually see the word heaven and so it's not necessarily it's capitalized because that's what he's calling it but not because it's where he lives right and, and that's and that's uh, and I that's I would agree with that. Also, in the Hebrew language, there are no capitals, so it's that's an interpretation note, not a not something that's actually in the original text. Mm -hmm. No. Nope. I think that's something that last week, Noah, you brought up. You were saying that it was it was in capital letters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's one of the things that that makes sometimes um, trying to interpret things a lot uh, tricky is that you're dealing with not only the original what whatever was said in the original text, but then you've got the redactors and how they would, um, you know, emphasize or change things, and then you've got the translators who may have changed things to fit their agenda, and you know that's why in in our um, in our uh, articles of faith. We say that we believe in the Bible as long as it's translated correctly, because we do recognize that there are mistranslations and and things in the Bible that are because of somebody who's making a commentary or um, or you know trying to emphasize some point for whatever agenda they were pushing at the time that they were doing that section or you know we recognize those things. Yeah, it's it, it, what was confusing me was that it was talking about uh, the waters above the firmament and the waters below the firmament, and what we would what we would consider those waters to be. Now we all know that Richard, you know, he 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 takes over this one and says, "Ah, it was people." Um, but just just to clarify and summarize, what do you guys think the waters represents when it talks about the waters above and below the firmament? Well, um, from my point of view, we're still in a period where everything's being organized before it's truly put together. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I actually love his, his, uh, his thing about people because it, it could certainly apply that way, um, depending on, on how you want to look at it. But for me, this is still preparatory. This is still um uh setting up and preparing the different um this is still an organization so um an organizational period and so you've got um you know setting up things for the the evaporation and clouds and and you know all of that that's that's being put together um 
what I do think is interesting, though, is that you also, um, you know, if if you're going to apply an understanding where um, God uses the natural resources of how the earth may have been formed naturally, that's taught in science, you know, um, one of the beliefs of how water got onto this earth was that um, when Jupiter was moving through the the um, asteroid belt and was pushing all of the the, um, the asteroids that are made of ice, you know, at some point all of that ice got pushed and bombarded the Earth, and that's one um, that's one um, theory of how water got onto the earth was from that bombardment of those ice asteroids mm-hmm. and uh you know you could you could easily have all of that being at play here if I, if stars well in in my argument if stars already existed and lived out their life and exploded to create heavier elements other than just helium and hydrogen i would absolutely agree with you Later in here, we'll, we'll get into a couple couple days from now or, or the next day. I think it actually might be the third the third day. Um, but yeah, later in the creation account, it starts talking about how he made the, the, the stars, the sun, and the moon, uh, and all that. And that's where I have an issue when it, com- when it comes to starting off with waters already there before stars exist. Uh, because you need stars to have water. Kirk, you got it. Oh, go ahead, Denise. Although to be fair, it's he's just saying uh, that you know he says the moon and the sun in the sky, so it, he's only talking about our specific star. It's not talking about uh, necessarily the rest of the stars, because I mean the ones that we can see are within a certain limit. That isn't necessarily the ones that started off the universe. Yeah, because right. remember, in the beginning, only applies to this Earth. It doesn't apply yeah. to the whole expanse of. of right universe so the the other the other real quick question uh, speaking as uh, from the science point of view is i found it interesting somebody mentioned that there had been uh water found underneath the mantle uh, or in the mantle of the earth and um so i really didn't know much about that so i went and looked it up this week and basically the uh, alternative hypothesis as to how uh, water got here is that it was contained in the minerals and basically pressure uh pressed out uh, the water that we have into the oceans. And so you have what's it left in the mantle. That's it's not liquid water sloshing around under the mantle. It's uh, contained in these uh, minerals, but that pressure, it basically, you do have a situation where water got separated from water. If you look at it from that point of view first. So if you're looking mm-hmm. at it from a science point of view, alternative. Yep. There's, there's certainly a, a, you know, and we have to, we have to remember that this story is being given to Moses to teach, specific so um and the lord is very clear that he teaches people line upon line and precept upon precept Mm -hmm. here a little and there a little so he's he's not saying everything exact oh this is exactly how it was done that would have overwhelmed the poor guy and was unnecessary for what he needed him to know so i i think this is very much just are you saying that the bible was only meant for him or i mean not the bible but the creation account because I mean, I, I am saying that the creation account that we are given is giving a very specific instruction to Moses that these are the worlds. This is what I have done. This is what I is my purpose. You know, I have made these things. You know, this is all part. None of this was haphazard. <clears throat> you know, I did this for a reason, and you are my reason. So, um, you know, I do think that that that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that these these accounts are there to teach the children Moses and and those who would follow him that you know I have made these things for a purpose you know this is not haphazard this wasn't some galactic accident you know I'm not just you know doing things on a whim I think that that's all part of what is being expressed here is that mm-hmm. all of this was done with intent and purpose. Mm-hmm. So in Genesis 1, 1, where it says God in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You don't think the heavens actually mean the rest of the universe, like the cosmos heaven was actually where it's stated here is simply heaven itself. Um, I think that the, the, 
that we are talking about the specifics of this earth and mm -hmm. and us but remember here um i also carry the belief that the first chapter of of genesis is a um because you know the scriptures say that the lord organized everything before it was placed on the ground before it was you know mm -hmm. so whether you want to view chapter one as a spiritual creation or a or, or where things were organized before they were then all put together however you want to view it um uh this was definitely this is definitely meant to teach that these things were done with purpose and for and not um just because god was you know bored one day and and <laughs> needed to you know learn about himself or something i don't know i i've i've heard so many um different different um explanations of oh the universe is learning about itself or something along well, as you can see i don't have any <laughs> any um respect for that but um yeah anyway well the the other point i wanted to make really quick is that if you read it from the standpoint that the water is under the mantle and on top of the mantle um you know and then he's giving this suspense called heaven it could you know if you read look at it from a per certain perspective from a jewish perspective he's saying uh the heaven that we're talking about is right here it's it's not that the heaven after you die way out you know wherever i live but this is and if you look at jewish theology geolo jewish theology in large part is centered on how you live here it is this is the creation that you've been given this is heaven. This is where your where your work is. This right. is what you're supposed to concentrate on. So from from a Jewish perspective, that's what I would walk away from it is is that he's he's underlining the idea that we're not we're not waiting till we die to have this become meaningful. This is supposed to be meaningful in the here and now. That actually so. lines up with uh with with my religious uh, affiliation with uh, Pastafarianism. Uh, is that when when the flying spaghetti monster first created the universe he created the firmament and the firmament had a uh, stripper factory and a beer volcano on it and he <laughs> the waters could be below and above the firmament like you were saying the mantle and then he realized that it was too good for humans so he brought it up uh, in, into where heaven is placed now and then created the regular earth so I mean that even lines up with my theology <laughs> Well, there you go. <laughs> I've always been looking for that missing link, you know. Yep, exactly. You just need yeah. his, you just need his noodly appendage to lead the way. And you have to have that final missing piece. <laughs> Kirk, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, I, I guess first, who doesn't like pasta? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, so, so you know, just briefly from what I've come to understand then that the earth was first created as a uh, what we would consider heaven and at the at the fall then it fell to a lower state of glory and it will return to its original state as a celestial or paradoxical uh, heaven and in our progression as spiritual or human souls through our choices through our actions through our obedience to God's commandments and ordinances then we can reside on that heaven as you know the printer lady is saying or we will be somewhere else on what is considered uh, um, it's going to be all of it's going to be better than what we have right now now do we know exactly what that means no to what degree I, I believe the word I believe what uh, revelation has told us about that even the worst level of glory is going to be so much greater than what it is here so to me that is such hope that um, there's a great place for everyone and I guess that's where I go with the whole 
how the earth was created and how it's now no matter what we do as humans the earth is going to get there because it is its own sentient soul Mm -hmm. it has its own soul just like we are a spirit just like we do and it will get there no matter if we're on it or not Mm mm-hmm I I think you're gonna you might like not to derail this at all, but you might like our guest for our main show tonight at eight. He is a Christian, but he is also claiming universalism, which means he believes that everybody, no matter what, is gonna get in heaven. Heresy. <laughs> <laughs> so that should be a fun episode. But uh, but yeah, uh, Noah and Mercy, what do you got to add to this? <laughs> Very interesting thoughts, but I do believe that the that um, what was happening? Okay, yes. Okay, so um, and God, okay. Anyways, I think it was like heaven as in as in the atmosphere as in the sky and then that god separated the waters from the water so i personally believe that i think there was this like almost like a water canopy over the earth that you know because because before noah's day it had never rained from the sky before it all they got their water up from the ground so which is consistent with the what the printer lady was talking about with the water being in the in the core. I could see that as being viable. Yeah. And well, that's why plants were able to grow. Yeah, it kind of created this greenhouse effect. Okay. Noah, anything? I don't subscribe to the canopy theory, but pretty much what she said. Okay, I was I was waiting for it. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> All right. Uh well if we don't have anything more to add, I will go forward and I, I'm actually gonna do it a couple verses at a time. And we'll just tie them all together, uh, just so we might be able to get through at least maybe the first chapter today. Uh, that's that's the, that's the goal. That'd be great. Uh, but You're if, dreaming big, man. Aspirations, man. <laughs> so, all right. So we're looking at verse nine, and it says, "And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so." And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering and the gathering together of the waters. Uh, called called he sees and God saw that it was good and God said let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit of the yielding and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seeds is in it in itself upon the earth and it was so what do we think about that one pretty much what we what we've already summed up already with the possibility of the water under the mantle is the ability for plants to, to grow. Yeah, I don't have a with that. Let the earth bring forth well, grass. I, 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 I definitely feel that this um, supports the idea that um, they were organizing things to to um, they were organizing things to uh, prepare the earth for um, uh, in in one of our additional scriptures um, in for this section of the creative period it says and the God said let us prepare the earth to bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit yielding fruit after his kind whose seed it in itself yieldeth its own likeness upon the earth and it was so even as they ordered mm-hmm. and so um um, so for here, it's not necessarily that they have planted everything at this point, but that it was prepared for when they were going to. Okay. And, and I do, I do, um, even though I am an atheist, I do see where it does say, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and all that stuff that came along with it. Uh, because that wouldn't make sense saying that God didn't just pop magical plants 
you know, in there because he's God, it, it, it would line up to it naturally, the earth naturally bringing forth um, grass and herb and, and trees with, with, its, with its fruit and all that stuff. Denise? Just saying, uh, science right now would lean toward the idea that we started off with bacteria on the earth that then grew into like algae and uh, at a certain point you get the blue algae that uh, started pumping oxygen into the atmosphere that allowed us to go from a CO2 atmosphere to an oxygen rich atmosphere and um, you know and, and Jews don't net narrow this down to 24 hour 24 literal hours it's more like a, a, uh, a measure of time. Right. Uh, which is not too specific, so uh, you could so you can spend you know as far as the Jews are concerned, this is basically again like an overview of how things came about. It's not necessarily meant as a uh, a manual on how to create your own earth. This is just you know right. so, <laughs> kind of a general yeah kind of a general overview of how things worked. But so, um, but you kind of had to have that plant life before you could support any animal life. So and that's in that regard, I think science probably. In a, if you look at it sideways, probably back set up. You know what I think is interesting about the um, about the idea of uh, well, like um, the the bacteria creating the oxygen and and everything. Um, that process, the process of of separating the waters, you know, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I when I was first learning about that that bacterial process that created oxygen and and everything i was like going well that's separating the waters there for you Mm -hmm. is that like separating like fresh water and salt water no it was actually creating oxygen and and they they if you go back to looking at the um if you look at the science on it they what they're finding out is that there's um they used to call them all bacteria, but now they have uh, archaea, which are now a new, a uh, whole new kingdom there. And um, they're finding that they are the uh, the be- the living things that can actually live in the most extreme circumstances. So they find the archaea at the bottom of the ocean in the uh, in the in the smoker vents at the bottom of the ocean, and they find all kinds of unusual life down there that they wouldn't expect when there's no sunlight, no. Uh, you know, there's acid, high acid. Uh, uh, these archaea can live in high acid, high base, high temperature, low temperature. I mean, those are extremely hardy little things. Um, and so they're, they're looking at those as being like the forerunners of uh, bacteria, the forerunners of uh, cells, the forerunners. Um, and there's actually a, a one theory out there that, that has uh, even humans like us is basically having started off with as a cooperating colony of bacteria who um, and I can get into how they come up with that but um, so if you look at it from the standpoint of uh, these bacteria become algae uh, they become you know these little one cell organisms that are floating around in the ocean the, the algae is actually what changed our, our the composition of our atmosphere so um, you know I, I look at it and kind of go okay I can, I can buy that sort of kind of yeah, the the only the only scruple I have with that is that I don't think scientists are saying that the Earth started off with bacteria. Um, I think no, they're yeah. This is part of, this is part of a process. Exactly. We're, we're yeah. about process, and we're just talking about a small piece of that process. Okay. That we, okay. That we that we as believers may find interesting as a natural process, you know, especially for those of us who don't believe that God just hocus pocused everything. You know, we believe that a natural process and things. Yeah, because I, I was kind of raised with the idea that God had a magic wand and he kind of went, you know, poof, there's an oak tree and poof, there's a, you know, whatever. So, and and so so to me, this is kind of like saying, hey, not, you know, this is you can you can argue that it was like she said, a, a natural process starting from the small things working its way up, rather than the magic wand effect of. You know, having all of a sudden an earth that all of a sudden has everything on it that you ever wanted. So let's let's take this perspective, or let me throw this perspective out. And so in Third Peter, or Second Peter, chapter three, verse eight, it says, "But behold, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day." So as we're going through this. One day 
it's a thousand take years. the Lord or God saying, I created this in one day, but on earth it's actually taken a thousand years evening and to morning create, okay. to create that one day. Um there you can you you could try and and do that and there are plenty of people who do uh. try it with that that six thousand year creation period time. Uh, the only problem is is that there are plenty of other places in the scriptures and even um, and for us Mormons, um, even in our own temple, where the term day is directly referred to as a creative period, not a defined time period. So I, I would take, I would take exception that um, that is referring to this time period. Um, there's also, uh, um, um, I've heard it argued that uh, there are references um, within the sky that um, time hasn't always been uniform. <laughs> and so. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so well, Wendy, so what do you, what do you do with Doctrine and Covenant 77? Which verse? Where it says that the temporal existence of the earth is 7,000 years. Um, that is clearly um, talking about a very specific... It's not. I've read that verse, and I don't see that as saying that the earth is only 7,000 years old. He's saying that his work, he's been working for 7,000 years. There's a specific work he's doing that's 7,000, but it's not a reference to the actual age of the earth. Another problem I would okay. take with a thousand year as a day thing is within the context of that verse, it's talking about the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. And so while it may feel like he's waiting out on you and not really doing things right away, to him, time is irrelevant. It doesn't necessarily mean that a thousand years is a, like one day is literally a thousand years to God. Because it also said that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but that doesn't mean on the thousand first hill he doesn't own the cattle. It's, it's funny that you say that because I literally yeah. just got my calculator out and was like, "All right, well, three sixty-five. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, seven days, and I got to two million five hundred and fifty-five thousand uh, years." And I was like, oh, "That's still a little bit short from what science says when when life started yeah. to come about on Earth." Yeah. Well, and here's another thing to keep in mind is that. Um, uh, you know, time on this on this earth, just on a geological scale, hasn't been all the same either. Um, you know, uh, when the moon was first made on this earth, it was very close to the earth, and then it has slowly been pulling back. And it is only in the last few millennia here where the earth was far enough away where we had this very um, stable 24 hour period mm -hmm. with the earth where it was but the earth used to be super close and we spun much faster in those in that time period so i really think that that if you will get yourself into trouble if you try and do the you know, 6,000 year old earth or the 6,000 year old creative period. I think you get yourself into a lot of trouble if you try and force that. It, to me, to me, it just means that, you know, we're talking about, uh, like Noah was saying, it's just, you know, it, God may not seem, he may be dragging his feet to you, but in his, in his world, this isn't even relevant. The time isn't relevant. And if you look at, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity with, again, with a sideways look, um, time really is kind of relevant. We always think of it as ticking along at a certain rate, but it isn't ticking along at a certain rate. It depends on how fast you're moving. And, um, and so even time is relative. So I think if you just get too literal and you're trying to pin these things down to too tight, I think it gets problematic because I think what he's really saying is, you know, like a, a day is a thousand years to God is it's kind of like, you know, don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's too big for you to worry about. So, you know, I don't think that it's a literal thousand. I think it's just like a, a really big comparison. Like you're never going to live a thousand years. So, you know, God takes an extra week. Really get this into perspective. You know? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I have a weird sense of humor. No, no, that, that, that makes I I like it. it makes sense. I like it. Yeah. Um, Wes, what do you got? You've been quiet. Uh, I was still thinking about the beer volcano. <laughs> the, the, the beer volcano. <laughs> 
No, uh, it sounds like I wish they had more in here. But yeah, it sounds like, it sounds like Epigenesis would go in here, 4.5 yeah. billion years ago. But this is all I see so far that would really talk about it. I mean, maybe a couple of persons more. Um, I don't just know. Just as an interesting side note, I went up and looked up Doctrine and Covenants 7712, which is what Kirk was referring to. And uh, do you guys want me to read it? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it's a um, uh, Doctrine and Covenants 77 is a question and answer um, section um, where um, questions are being asked and and the, the Lord supposedly is giving, um, or somebody is giving an answer. I'd have to look up the whole section. But uh, 12 goes, question, what are we to understand by the sounding of the trumpets mentioned in the eighth chapter of Revelation? And the answer is, we are to understand that as God made the world in six days, and on the seventh day he finished his work and sanctified it, and also formed man out of the dust of the earth, even so in the beginning, oh, I lost my spot, sorry. I mean, six days. Do, 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 do. Even so, in the beginning of the seven thousand years, will the Lord God sanctify the earth and complete the salvation of man and judge all things and shall redeem all things, except that which he hath not put into his power, when he shall have sealed all things unto the end of all things, and the sounding of the trumpets are the seven angels are preparing the finishing of his work in the beginning of the seven thousand seven thousand years, the preparing of the way for the time of his coming. So here, the 7,000 being mentioned is referring to, um, uh, it, it's making a reference to the assumption of, um, uh, you know, 6,000 years since Adam left the garden, which is what, you know, most people have believed this whole time. But it, it, it really isn't saying that the earth was made 7,000 years ago. It's saying that the salvation of man will be finished after 7,000 years. And so, um, and the time of the coming is being prepared. So it's not really making a reference to a six or a 7,000 year old earth. It's referring to the process um, that is being done for the, the salvation of man. What? No one's on the phone. Interesting take. So. Yeah. Anybody have anything to add before we move forward? No? No? Going once? Going twice? All right. So. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so verse 14 says, And God let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, I did hear briefly within earlier in this episode and also in the previous episodes that somebody in here already thought that he made the sun and the moon. What do you guys think about this one? Um... <laughs> no, um, so, uh, oh, good grief, where am I? Oh, do, 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 Oh, just to add on, verse 15 is, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens, or of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. I think those go do 16, too, while you're at it. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. So that's where I have my big scruple right there, is because that's when he made stars. How are we having water and unorganized matter to create the earth before we have the stars to live their lives out, explode, and then create heavier elements to create the matter that would be the earth? Um, I've got um, the the commentary I've got on this says, says that it appears that the sun, moon, and stars were created and set in the heavens after the earth was created. 
the Hebrew can be understood otherwise. It here translates the Hebrew Natan, N-A-T-A-N, but its basic meaning is gave or provided. Natan is translated in the Bible hundreds of times with that meaning. Thus, the sun, moon, and stars were provided as light sources for the earth. The stars and sun could have been associated with the worlds without number created earlier by God through his son. Many worlds have been created, many had passed away, and many now stand. And so, um, uh, in the in this commentary that that I'm also using, um, they they view this again as that things were being set up and provided for. Not necessarily the Earth was created with with plants and then the sun and everybody else was, but that um, the, the uh, that uh, all of this was being prepped to be all put together. And so um, now why does the Lord tell Moses um, this particular order at this time? You know, that we could argue that one all, all day long, I think. But um, it's clear that, that we're being told here that uh, all of this was provided by the Lord. Does it mean it was created after the earth was created? Probably not simply because of the way that that word is being translated. So it's described differently in Hebrew text than it is English. Yeah. Right. The Hebrew, the Hebrew wow. isn't, this isn't uh, nearly as um, literal. Let's put it that way. It's not as, it's a lot more uh, open to your interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I also wanted to point out, though, too, that when, if you're looking at things from the perspective of the Earth, we can't see past our uh, very much past our own solar. You know, our you know we can't see very far into our own galaxy. So if you're looking at our galaxy being formed from a bunch of of dust, well, that's, you know, say, you say you, you, we can't see very far even into our own galaxy. Yeah, I mean, we've got billions of stars that are we, in we in know, our own. We've we've demonstrated not demonstrated, but we've observed. The Andromeda Galaxy on its I, way on a crash course to us. So we we've seen well past our own galaxy. Well, yes, but we've done it with telescopes and and fancy equipment. Your your basic eyeball well, isn't going to see that far. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree with that. I just thought that you thought that we only have been able to discover things within oh, our own galaxy. No, no, I was no. like, no, that's no, no. I'm just talking about from the perspective of these scriptures. In the time that they, you know, we didn't have telescopes yeah. back then. I got, in the time, I got Yeah, in the time that we're talking about, you know, people couldn't see that far, mm -hmm. uh, relatively speaking. And and not only that, but our our whole our whole galaxy system formed after a whole lot of other things out in outer space had blown up. So um, so we're talking about, you know, did the Earth form? I was just looking it up because I couldn't remember how this worked exactly because this isn't really my strong suit. Um, but it, you know, it. I can't find anything that says that the that the clump that became the Earth didn't start at the same time the Sun did. We there is some there is some evidence that the Moon actually came from Earth, that it was uh, the Earth was hit by a, a nice large piece of space junk, and that the Moon actually was formed out of the Earth. So all I'm saying is that I just wouldn't hold it too literal that you know it has to have happened in this particular order. All these things could have been laid out in that big swirling gas clump that became our solar system, um, it, I don't see it as being particularly organized at this particular point. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I really... I, I, I just I, wouldn't I, agree with that. I, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. But if, if it wasn't intended to be a descriptive, intricate uh, t telling of the creation story, then why not just say, "Hey, I created everything." Trust me. Why, why does he go? That, why does he go into because, detail with things that aren't detailed? But well, he's giving enough detail to to let Moses know that I set order to this. I mm -hmm. set order to this. This didn't happen by accident. Mm -hmm. This didn't happen on the whim of the gods. This didn't happen. Remember, you've got. Um, 
you know, you're we're we're teaching Moses. Moses was was raised in Egypt, you know, by Hebrew. Hebrew. He may have been raised by Hebrews, but mm -hmm. he was still influenced by the Egyptian family and and of the culture he was in. Um, very much the 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 religious views of the day were that the gods were just doing things on a whim. You were at the whim of the gods. It you you know you were basically nothing. You were just their playthings. And the Lord is making it very clear here. You are deliberate. This world is deliberate. This universe is deliberate. All of the worlds that have come and have passed away are deliberate. There is nothing here that was made by accident, on a whim, because I was bored, because I didn't have anything better to do on Tuesday. You know, there, this is a very specific um, uh, telling to teach Moses that this was done with deliberation. I, I, I okay. I mean, I, I would understand why you would have to really break it down Barney style for, you know, Moses, because that's, you know, the intelligence back in the day. Um, I just kind of equate this to God saying that he's not the author of confusion. And if I'm using the brain that he gave me to analyze these texts and saying, ah, this doesn't really line up with science, that's kind of confusing for me, and which would mean that what God portrayed to Moses, I am now reading and getting confused over, which I wouldn't believe yeah. at that point God would be the author of confusion. Well, it gets even more I don't think so. when you realize that there's two different stories that, that exist in chapter one and two. So mm -hmm. um, again, I think we, for me, I'm a very practical person. I look at it and kind of go, humans are stuck on this planet. We're wandering around you know, at the whims of hurricanes we don't understand, tornadoes we don't understand, earthquakes we don't understand, you know, a lot of things that are going on that, you know, that, you know, your basic humanoid standing out in the middle of the field is wondering what the heck is going on. And so we make up stories to to comfort ourselves, to tell ourselves that there really is order to everything. And um, I yeah. think that, you know, when, when we try to nail that down too hard, we forget that a lot of, you know, a lot of these things are people trying to understand the, the things that they didn't have the tools to understand at the time. And for me now, I can, you know, yeah, we can look out. We've got the Hubble. We can see way out, way, way, way out there now. Um, but they didn't have that advantage back then. And so I think to me that this is really a story of, of making sense out of the nonsensical. Um, and I think humans have done that. If you look into any society, you'll find that all of them have a creation story of some kind mm -hmm. that make sense of the un, uh, insensible. I, years ago, when when uh, Mount St. Helens blew up, I got to thinking, you know, we knew that Mount St. Helens was going to blow up because we had sensors on the mountain, we had observers on the mountain, we could, you know, and we were, anybody who was in the Seattle area knew that Mount St. Helens was about to blow our top. Um, but I got to thinking, you know, if we didn't have all that news media, and and my, my grandma at the time lived in um, Port d'Alene, Idaho, and all of a sudden, you know, she's sitting there and without the benefit of television, and without the benefit of radio, and all of a sudden the sky turns black and starts raining dirt. Um, you know, what would you make of that if you were somebody who lived thousands of years ago? Yeah. I mean, I mean that, know, that, equates to, that equates to Zeus, you know, being, being yeah. the, the, the reason or the, uh, the cause of lightning bolts being hurled down on Earth. You yeah. Know? And, you know, you're... Oh, sorry. Uh, it's just, it's, to me, it's just, it's just if we try to pin it down too tight, we just are really forgetting that we're talking to humans who really were looking for a reason to under, understand their world and a reason to make sense out of it. And that's, it, in my view, that's all that this really is about, is it's about making sense of things that may not have made sense to the people who are there. Gotcha. And when you're dealing with people who, you know, it's not like Moses and the Israelites had the level of scientific understanding we have now. Yeah, it's it, it's confusing to us now, but that's because of the level of knowledge that we have. So we didn't have that level or the same level of knowledge. From that. Whoa. Uh, massive echo. But the Lord has to teach people at the level they're able to understand 
and bring them up to a higher a uh, higher understanding and he does that bit by bit piece by piece he doesn't just all lay it all out and say here's everything he just he just doesn't and the scriptures have several references to where um not everything has been taught not everything has been revealed and the lord doesn't reveal things in its entirety because people aren't ready for it mm -hmm. so i i think that if you're going to try and use the argument well why didn't god just teach us everything i i think that that's an invalid argument because you don't teach a first grader what you teach a first year college student mm -hmm. you know that first grader doesn't have the same knowledge base no and and, and i think the lord deals with people at the level that they're at unless you place it on their hearts kind of like morality if God has placed morality on our hearts, that's something that we, from from my understanding, having five kids of my own, and I'm sure you guys you guys have kids of your own, you have to teach them what's right and wrong. You have to teach them morality. Um, mm -hmm. It's said that God has placed morality on you know on our hearts. If if it was taught to us or it placed on our hearts, I don't think we would need to learn it. And that's something that you know if if God can can do some things you know already already program uh the understanding of certain things I, I i'm not saying i'm not making the argument i heard you say this wendy that that god should just teach us everything i i don't i i don't believe that that would that would be in line with free will and and giving us the ability to learn certain things but being at least clear on things that we can't really investigate at all like things that occurred before the first human ever existed. You know, nobody could ever possibly investigate these things, which means that the belief in the creation story is solely on faith itself. There, there is no evidence really to, to, to be able to investigate. And this is what makes, from my point of view, personal revelation and modern revelation mm -hmm. so vitally important why you need to have a, a living prophet, why you have to have these things so that at, because as we all know, knowledge is ages. It happens all the time. You know, um, the Bible refers to many books that we no longer even have, you know? And so, um, there's so much we no longer have that has to be restored. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that um, uh, that's why it's important to have that relationship with God and you have to be getting that because you can't just look at this and say, oh, this is what it means. There's pieces missing. There, it's, it's been redacted by a hundred people and, and a bunch of scholars who didn't know how to read or who were just copying t letters or it was, um, you know, um, we know for a fact that... Uh, various biblical redactors over the centuries like to put plays on words um, as they were re rewriting, you know, the scrolls. And so um, they like to put their interpretation or play on names or, you know, um, uh, for instance, the, um, uh, the biblical reference to the Pharaoh Shishak, uh, which a lot of people think is a reference to Ramses the Great. Um, uh, Shisha is a is actually a nickname for for a pharaoh, but if you put a K on it, it changes that name to mean like the plunderer of worlds or something. You know, so there's a lot of um, <laughs> you know, so it's it's a. I just don't think it's that cut and dry. Mm -hmm. I know that we would like it to be cut and dry. Um, but I just don't think that human frailty allows us to be that cut and dry hmm. well con the other thing is i think uh, I, I it may be a matter of doctrinal statement that when i was growing up in the in the church i was taught that the bible was literally true the way that you read it so in my english version uh in the 20th century if i read the bible it had to be literally true and i was not allowed to doubt uh anything you know that the earth was created in six days there was no other alternative reading to that mm -hmm. um and it, if i you know if i bought into an alternative reading then, then i was somehow denigrating my faith and um and, and that for me it caused a real problem at a certain point because i am i do like science and i started reading things it's kind of like well I, you know 
either God setting me up to believe a bunch of deceit by prevent, prevent, presenting a whole lot of evidence in a physical world that doesn't line up with this literal reading, or there's an alternative reading to the scripture that allows me to keep my faith and follow the science. And I chose that path. Um, and so for years before I even left the Christian church, I, I let go of the literal reading just because um, the evidence piled up. And it's kind of like, well, I can either believe the evidence or I can believe this very tight literal reading in a different language in a different time of these scriptures. And, I'm, and I, when, the more I learned about Hebrew, the more I realized that if you, you know, the Hebrew really isn't that tight. So for me, I let go of the literalness of it and just kind of went, I'm going with the idea that this was a broad description. I'm not going to worry about the details. Um, and I allowed the evidence of science to, to build up the other part of what I believed because I, I, I tend to follow the evidence. So I think it really only causes a problem if your doctrine is that you have to believe it literally this way in the English in this understanding I, yeah. otherwise i think there's a lot of room there to, to kind of alter your belief to to what you want <sighs> to how much science you want to accept hey i heard that to what you want i heard mm -hmm. that <laughs> yeah. does, does anybody have anything else that they want to add i'm actually going to shut it up or not shut it up but shut the show down here in just a second um i just want to make sure if anybody has any final thoughts um, How many Kurt, verses did we clear today? Like three? We cleared eight verses today. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's good. <laughs> I just want to say real quick, I'm really glad Wendy, I think, and Denise, and we follow science. I love what she said about the evidence. And I thank Kurt, too. Got anything else to add, Kurt? Okay. Nope. Thank you for nope. joining us last minute. What, what's up? Yeah. No, I already un unmuted you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I saw you sitting back there. I was like, he's not reaching that <laughs> mute button. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for, for coming together again on another uh, on another Saturday. Um, I really appreciate the conversations that we have. I appreciate we got through actually eight verses today. That's a that's a yeah. that's a step in the right <laughs> direction for us. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate your guys' thoughts. Um, everybody in the chat, thank you for showing up. We'll be doing this every single Saturday um, with typically the same people. Sometimes we have some newer people in, like Kirk and Angelisa. Uh, they they jumped in last minute uh, to help us out here, and we appreciate them showing up. Uh, in about 56 minutes, we'll be going live uh, with Brandon Hampton, who is a Christian universalist who believes that everybody no matter what is going to heaven um so that's going to be a fun conversation i'm going to have mike carey co-hosting with me tonight which i'm really excited about too he's from the the one good reason um he just put out a show last night about distant minds how we how we compare humanism if we were to meet an alien species would we treat them with the same humanistic uh humanistic uh compassion that we do humans or or would we or would we like many different movies treat them with uh uh with more defensive measures uh but it, that was a really good conversation go check it out if you can um he just put it up last night on the one good reasons page uh make sure you type in the number one and not one because uh, it took me a while to find this page just type in the one good reason but yeah thank you everybody uh stay home stay safe